the Lakewood City Council study session of August 1st, 2016, uh, 7 p.m. to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Paul? Here. Wickman? Vincent? Here. Roy Ball? Here. Harrison? Here. Johnson? Here. Shakti? Here. Abel? Here. Coop? Here. Franks? Here. Gutwein? Here. You have a quorum. Fantastic. Well, I'd like to welcome the folks who are here in chambers. I'd like to thank our Lakewood agents for stopping by and making sure we're safe. And I'd like to wish everybody a happy Colorado Day as we celebrate our 140th year as a state, signed by Ulysses S. Grant in 18. What's the year? 76. <laughs> so we have a, a light agenda tonight, or at least it might seem that way. We're going to have a couple presentations. Our first one is going to be wayfinding and signage, and this group managed to make it here. So I will call up Roger Wadnell, Comprehensive Planning and Research Division Manager. Good evening and welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. We'll wait a second here for the presentation to the screen to come down. Um, this is an in informational item, so no action is being requested from City Council tonight. But we're here to talk, or I'm here, to talk about um, citywide identity and wayfinding and why this topic is being brought up is we've been getting a lot of requests both from businesses and from citizens in terms of wayfinding signs. Um, we've heard from the Belmar group looking for identity signs maybe on their property or they have, they have them on their property, but even um, directing them to downtown Lakewood or Belmar along the Alameda corridor. When we were developing the comprehensive plan there was a lot of discussion with the citizen group and at public meetings about kind of strengthening Lakewood's identity in the region, how we can do this, and things like, um, and I'll have some examples here in a moment, city identification signs or, or signs that direct you within the city to districts or to neighborhoods or within districts. So anyway, that's kind of why we're here, and the idea is to kind of look at more of a comprehensive approach and how to, to look at all of these elements and how can we best strengthen Lakewood's already strong identity, but to even strengthen it further with um, a comprehensive set of uh, maybe standards that can be implemented um, at entry points and things like that. So I will talk a little bit about kind of why we're doing this. I've kind of hit on that already. Some of the design principles we're looking at. Again, these are concepts. Nothing's been um, built. Nothing's been really designed beyond a con you know, some con conceptual items. So it's really a discussion item for council at this point. And then um, what are some of the citywide identity elements and how they can be best uh, possibly implemented and suggesting how we can get move forward on it. So the basis for the program, in this first slide, if you take a look, um, are some examples of what some other communities have done. It's kind of a little bit hard to read, but this water tank is in Arvada, and kind of, you've probably driven by a lot of this stuff anyway. This is a identity feature in Arvada. Westminster, City of Westminster has done some things on bridges along I-25. They've been there for quite some time. Um, Denver Tech Center, it's, it's, you know, you could, you've, we've all driven by, you know, this iconic image. Now, whether you like the images or not or, the, you know, the content, the idea is some of these are, are pretty identifiable. And I think Lakewood has some opportunities to even strengthen the, its identity through some images, through a comprehensive approach. I wanted to include this item and this is actually in Lone Tree. This is a simulation, but it's a proposed bridge, and I think their council has approved this. I think it's a little, a little much. But <laughs> it's, I want to show the range of things, okay? Um, but this is over Lincoln Avenue, and, they've, and it's a giant leaf on a bridge. You know, whether you like it or not, it's a bold statement. We'll put it that way. But I wanted to show that some other communities are doing some things and have been doing some things, so this isn't a unique you know, concept for Lakewood as well. 
Um, here are a couple examples of things that maybe could look a little bit better. Um, this is the entry the, on, on the image on the right is the entry to Lakewood at Sheridan. This, the original sign actually got demolished, so this is put up. I think the imaging, or the, the messaging is good, but it could hang together a little bit better. Um, on, on the left are some wayfinding signs in this area, and uh, you'll notice there are different colors. You know, I think, you know, making, you know, um, kind of standard colors, and so you know you're within Lakewood, you're within a district, so some common themes, but to still um, encourage creativity. I think Lakewood does have a strong brand with the city, you know, city logo, um, All America City. So I think the brand is strong. It's just a matter of getting it out there and getting it out there appropriately. I wanted to show this example just to talk about scale for a moment. If you've seen these signs at Sheridan, they're not lit. They were at one time. Um, and they are 26 feet tall. And whether, again, you like the image or not, they're meant as an entry to Co the Colfax Corridor. One of the things that being 26 feet tall, uh, on the next slide, looking from the Denver side, that's not even, even uh, tall enough to make a big impact. So I think another point to make is for some of the major, the areas where you really want to make a strong impact, I think you need to make a bold statement and just kind of putting some ideas out there. Because, for example, um, the Century Theater Tower there, or the Spire, that's 88 feet in Belmar. And it still doesn't stick up, you know, that much above all the other elements. So just an idea of being, you know, of being bold, maybe not necessarily being bold in every location, but where you want to make a strong statement to be bold. Um, some other design principles. Um, the design elements need to kind of have a contemporary and a, a timeless feel. I don't think we'd be looking at trendy things, you know, some things that would stand up over time, and to be consistent and still have an ability to be creative within different districts. And I've got a couple of examples here of uh, a little bit of great creativity within districts. And the other point to make is there's a lot of existing infrastructure that could be taken advantage of, bridges, for example. So instead of looking to build new monuments, which, you know, could be done too, but there are some locations where the infrastructure is already there, and it's just a matter of um, kind of claiming that for Lakewood. And some of the design principles uh, we're kind of discussing, and uh, we hired a uh, – we we're working with a consultant. Uh, Keelan Smith, who's, who's here with Inherent Character, helped – us because he's worked with a lot of other communities in the, in the past as well. But to do uh, put materials that are very durable over time, stainless steel, brick, even translucent materials that, that hold up, um, you'll see some of the elements, the red sandstone that's um, on, the, on the Belmar sign, which I think works fairly well. So the idea is to have really durable, propose really durable materials when, if and when, you know, move forward on some of these elements. So within Lakewood, um, I wanted to point this out. There are a number of districts that have their own identity, obviously. Um, you'll see an example on the 40 West area in, uh, in the Colfax Corridor. You've got kind of the downtown Lakewood. Belmar definitely has its own uh, design theme. Denver West um, is pulling together some things. So the idea is not to just impose kind of a standard uh, template, but to allow for creativity within, within kind of an umbrella design. These are some elements that are being designed for the 40 West Arts District. Um, you can tell they're pretty colorful, but, you know, it's an art district, and they're looking at doing these elements um, in a couple of the Colfax medians. They haven't been installed yet, and there's still some work to be done, but this illustrates, okay, it's an art district, um, maybe there's more color, maybe there's more uniqueness to the design, maybe it's more quirky looking than some of the other um, locations in Lakewood. Um, this, again, is another design being worked upon for the Alameda Corridor, 
This would be a prototype for a sign at Alameda and, and uh, Sheridan. And the, the idea here would be Alameda originally, and it continues to be the gateway to, um, ultimately to Red Rocks, that's what it was kind of originally laid out to be, to sort of utilize some of those materials um, for that. So just kind of some examples of how individual districts can be unique within the overall umbrella. Um, this would be some secondary um, elements along Alameda that could happen. And then Denver West, um, I think they're looking to kind of pull everything together. These, this map shows all the different sub-districts. There's Colorado Mills, there's Denver West, there's Office, there's some residential. And um, it's kind of in the early stages, but they're looking to do more to pull, kind of pull that whole identity together as well. So individual districts, I think, can have their own identity. Um, but some of the citywide identity elements, I think there's some real opportunities, and I just wanted to show just some examples. And I, Again, I had mentioned bridges. Um, I think there's some real opportunities at entry points in major um, areas along 6th Avenue, uh, along light rail, to really have an impact and utilize existing infrastructure. For example, um, here is the RTD bridge. It's uh, looking to the west. It's a real iconic element. There's a real opportunity to really, you know, utilize this to um, to brand Lakewood and to know you're in Lakewood. Obviously, we need to work with RTD, but if you're to do something very simple, like a lettering on the bridge with the, the city logo, it would be relatively inexpensive and would have a pretty good impact. So I think this is a really good opportunity to think about um, in terms of some identity elements. And there are a lot of other bridges in the city as well. Here's another example, in, uh, a bridge at Denver West. And again, um, the exact you know lettering style could could be altered. This is just to show what that could look like. You also could do more. This is another view, kind of to the west. This is the RTD bridge, and you could have elements such as uh, banners. Uh, there's this is a little bit hard to see, but there's uh, like Lakewood along the side, kind of like Westminster has done. Um, you can do some things on the top of the bridges. So there's a whole uh, kind of range of opportunities that might be, uh, I would think, untapped. And some could be more costly than others, but some could be fairly simple to, to do. Obviously, we'd have to work with CDOT and RTD on some of these, the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, this kind of lays out kind of the menu of, of some of these elements. And I wanted to show this, and hopefully this little video works, of there are more opportunities when you're kind of coming into Lakewood when you're going under a bridge than over a bridge. This is a little simulation if you're going north on Wadsworth under the 285 bridge under Hamden. And let's see if we can get this thing to work. So if you're going north... You can see there's elements along the side as well, you know, driving, obviously. But you can see kind of the opportunities. And then if you're kind of going the other way, you could do some things on the bridge abutments. That would be like you're coming out on 6th Avenue over Sheridan. So this is kind of meant to show what are the opportunities kind of going under a bridge as well as going over. Um, there's another opportunity on, and this would be relatively inexpensive, on traffic signal mast arms that they're owned by the city. And you, these are, there's a number of these with these H's are right at Sheridan, right on the border, but you could, you could put a, you know, just simple Lakewood logo. It would be relatively inexpensive, and the city, you know, would own, the, would own or the city owns these uh, mast arms, so that would be pretty simple. Um, a number of wayfinding elements, and again, I'm going back to some of the comments that we received from the community is 
is you know, finding where, where being directed to the light rail stations, being directed to Belmar, Lakewood City Commons, and some of the uh, Colorado Mills, Denver West. Um, so these Ks on there are opportunities for wayfinding. Um, this would be kind of within downtown Lakewood and Belmar, all of the different locations where there are wayfinding signs. And I think a lot of them don't kind of hang together as good as they could. And we're really not talking about any fancy design, but just basic um, kind of consistency of lettering, getting the Lakewood logo out there, maybe Lakewood blue. This is looking a little purplish on the screen, but it's, it's supposed to, or maybe there's more in my eyes. My eyes. Okay, I'm partially. That's the color blindness of my eyes. Okay. Um, but anyway, here is uh, here here are some other examples. But the idea is you want uh, consistency, so you kind of know you're in a district, and you know you, you know you're in a district within Lakewood. Again, they, those necessarily may not be the final design, but I, I think they give you a feel for what could be. And then finally, another item, and this is more of a kind of a fun item, is some movable identity feature. You know, what if you had a sculptural element that you could move to a park or to whoops, Civic Center Plaza or somewhere else? Um, I think it would create some interest and it could, it could create some um, identity. For example, you know, this is not movable, but I think everybody recognizes the blue bear. I don't think it's moved um, since it got there, but it's iconic element, okay? This is actually a movable feature on the left at Cherry Creek Arts Festival. And uh, what if you were to, to have a sculptural element that could, that could move around, okay? Um, this is it's called the Big Wonderful in Denver. It's kind of a glorified, um, like a flea market, but they have this sign that, that moves around. So anyway, what if... Now, this is not in Lakewood. I think it's in the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, but it's an iconic image, okay, I just for an example. What if you had an image like this? We can't exactly probably take this one. But what if you took an image like this or, you know, had a contest, you had a sculpture? Maybe it's a form of a Lakewood logo, I don't know. But what if this moved around to the Lakewood Wadsworth Plaza, okay? Or to the Civic Center, okay? Um, or to a park, I think it would create some interest, and I, and I think it would bring some attention to uh, Lakewood in terms of um, identity as well. Um, implementation, just wanted to mention, I think the point to make on implementation is you probably should do more than one element, uh, you know, kind of a grouping of either entry signs, something on a bridge. It doesn't have to be um, overly expensive necessarily, but the idea is to make an impact so you start to read some of these um, elements through the community. Um, for example, this could be like the, the entire menu of identity elements, bridge elements, and uh, you know, maybe you just do selective elements on bridges and some wayfinding. I'm just, the B would be the elements on the bridges, K wayfinding. Another approach might be to do some identity elements on the mast arms and at the entries to the city. Or another um, approach would be to do some, I, th I think, again, I keep coming back to the bridge um, elements, but I think there's a, there's a real opportunity there. Or do some of the movable identity features as well. Um, so that's what I'd kind of like to leave you with in terms of some ideas, but I wanted to you know, remind you, you know, this is, these are concepts. We're not requesting any action from council, but the idea is to present or to start thinking about developing a comprehensive approach um, to get a more of a consistent image, allow for creativity, and then have an overall program that can be inc implemented incrementally. So with that, um, again, Keelan Smith with Inherent Character is avail is available too, but if you have any questions, we certainly would be um, here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a fun journey of what could be. I think it's interesting, or, or what sticks out to me, and it's nice with, we have a continuity on our street signs. 
we know that when you're in the city of Lakewood, they're blue, although the Rooney Valley is kind of different, unfortunately. But the rest of the city is blue, and so this is kind of building off of that. I did have a question about, did you take a look at, I know you know, we take great pride in our different neighborhoods. Some of our neighborhoods have actual signage that states what neighborhood you're in. Did you go as far into that with this type of cohesive plan or doing some sort of unique wayfinding for our unique neighborhoods? Um, with this, not quite yet. I think it can. That would be kind of the next level to be taken, to be taken with this. But I think the idea again is to have creativity, but still have some sort of a consistency, so that you know you're in a lake in a neighborhood within Lakewood, and that could could easily be done. And then um, I'm I'm excited to hear that we might actually see that Colfax sign light up again sometime. That is um, something that we're taking a look at, yes. Thank you, that's great. And maybe RTD could make sure that their lights light up on their bridge, because I think those were supposed to stay lit for a decade or two without having to change the bulbs. That quite hasn't yes, happened. it hasn't <laughs> continued, no. All right. Um, and then the last thing I would comment on, it, it would be nice to utilize, I guess, those mast arms, and we could potentially use those for even banners, you know, since we've had a problem with XL not allowing us to utilize the poles for for banners and things like that. That seems like a good opportunity for us in certain areas to do some wayfinding on on our own property. So we have quite a few lights up. I had uh, Ms. Harrison and Ms. Vincent. We'll start there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a couple of things. I love the, the wayfinding signs, and, and thanks for all the work that um, you've done on this, Roger. One of, just question and, and what we're looking at here, the bridge um, that's got Lakewood sign on it, would the letters be potentially lit, backlit, or were you thinking just the letters on there? No, I think that uh, there's a potential to, to backlight them, and there's some challenges in how to, to achieve that. You can do that through solar or to get some you know wiring to it, although the bridge, like the mayor had mentioned, was lit you know, at the opening ceremonies. It was so. There is a, the idea is that it would be lit so that it could be um, really noticeable in the evening. Yes. Um, thank you. Very. I, that is correct, and it should. That bridge should be lit. I've had several of my constituents ask me about that. So hint, hint, hint. RTD. Um, question about graffiti on the bridges that where you showed just a, a blue stripe on them. Do you think that would create a blank canvas for our graffiti artists? Well, right now the the bridges are pretty blank. I mean, you know, and they, but they, they still do, get graffiti. And they still get graffiti. Typically we find that when, no, these aren't murals, obviously, but when murals are put up, graffiti goes down dramatically. So, and I think in some of these locations, I know graffiti um, artists, um, can get to about any location, but they are fairly difficult to get to. Okay. I hope you're right. Um, we've had several people ask about the cultural center actually having a lighted sign that would come in off of Alameda that would be a stronger wayfinding sign, especially in nights when things are going on at the cultural center. So it would be kind of a helpful way, probably on Alameda as well as maybe on Wadsworth. Um, and then the last comment that I would make is, as to the height of signs, I understand what you're talking about in terms of the statement that it makes, but I think it will be really hard if the city goes higher with our signs than what we'll allow in our planning code. It's really hard to say, yes, the city can make it really high and make a big statement, but then not allow a business to do the same. I, I wouldn't be able to support that. So mm -hmm. thank you. Ms. Vincent, then Mr. Royball. Um, yes. I'd like to thank the mayor for asking my first question about the lights at Colfax and Wadsworth. Um, whether you like that or not, it's, it's kind of funky when you see it all kind of blue and pink and stuff at 2 in the morning coming home. Um, the other thing is, is there have been some historical signs. I'm thinking of one that's at Colfax and Carr. It's, it's a historical marker identity. Um, 
have you looked at any of those sort of things to carry that on? Um, I think that's a possibility. Um, that's, that certainly would be within the menu of the type of signs that would be considered. <coughs> yes, uh, you know, it hasn't been part of our initial research, but certainly that um, would need to all kind of fit within the, the family of signs. So. Okay, thank you. Mr. Royball, then uh, Mr. Abel. Ah, thank you. This is fantastic. Just wanted to ask a couple uh, background questions. And again, I'm young and naive. Um, the Lakewood logo, is there uh, any history to that, how it was made, where it was made, and, and the, the um, findings behind that? I think it would be great to share with the rest of the residents of Lakewood. And I have no idea what it is. And then also the other comment that uh, came to mind very quickly is our neighborhoods throughout the city are very unique. And I would like to see if, if we're going to put signs up to have them match the neighborhoods, like the Addenbrook Park, you know, the history of Addenbrook and maybe bring out a little bit of history of it or Ray Ross, or if you, you know, different parks that come around, if we can just kind of, you know, keep the signage the same style, but kind of emphasize the neighborhoods, uh, you know, kind of bring them out. So people don't forget, don't forget uh, what Lakewood's all about, you know, but that was just my comment. Mr. Abel and Ms. Shakti. Nice presentation, some really good ideas. Um, this bridge, like Arvada's water tower, this bridge says Lakewood even without the sign on there. It irritated me no end that a couple of years ago, Southwest Airlines planted a Denver city limit sign or imposed one graphically or digitally in front of this bridge, welcome to Denver. So I think this would keep uh, Denver from using our symbols for one thing. Um, the, I like the idea of having our uh, identity on the uh, traffic arms, traffic light arms, except that the ones you showed us were pretty small. And graphics are supposed to grab your eye without diverting your attention, really. And I think to see those, you'd, a driver would have to take his eye off the road. One of the strengths of the other things, like the sound on this bridge and the uh, uh, rock work on the uh, bridge out near Mills Mall, is that it makes the statement, you see it, it burns an imprint, and you don't have to take your eye off of the road when you're driving. Um, there's another question kind of uh, on what Ms. Harrison was saying, Mr. Cox, and that is that there's a new Supreme Court ruling on signs that says if you let one entity have a sign with LED lights and flashing neon <coughs> at 10 feet by 10 feet, then everybody gets a sign like that no matter what their message is. So would we be opening the door by having signs. Uh, I, and I don't mind drawing more attention to our city and our community than we do to, uh, than, than the businesses uh, can put up along the street because if we did that, then we wouldn't be able to see the buildings behind the signs or one, you tell one sign from another. But is that a consideration? I think it absolutely is. You know, we, we have plans to review our sign code in light of that decision. This is the Arizona case, I assume you're talking about. Um, and that'll be coming up later this year. And that's absolutely something to consider is, is how the change in our regulatory authority from that case affects our ability to put up our own signs and, and, and uh, the interaction between government signs, business signs. As you know, that case talks about... Uh, doing away with distinctions based on content. So it really comes down to what do they look like. And in, in one respect, it wasn't, wouldn't matter who has it if it has that uh, visual impact. So that's, that's going to be part of the discussion for sure. Okay. And I, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, 
Mr. Roy Ball and the mayor about uh, identifying our neighborhoods. Uh, it's nice to have like the Iberhood sign, but uh, being placed in the middle of the street might not be the best idea. And uh, a lot of those signs are uh, antiquated. So I think uh, as we're looking at updating it or putting in this new uh, and flashy signage elsewhere that we ought to uh, go ahead and throw the neighborhood signs into that mix right off the bat. <clears throat> but it's a really nice concept and thanks for bringing it to us. Ms. Shockey, then Mr. Coop. Um, I echo everybody, lots of good ideas. Um, and the, the reason I pushed the button was actually to say um, what Councilor Abel said about the arms uh, it looked like on Sheridan there are a lot of um, arms. What is it called? Mast arms. Mast arms. And so, um, if there, if it was possible to have a bigger um, message on the, is it possible to put a bigger message on the mast arms? I think we have to we'd have to look at what the si what the um, kind of bearing weight of the structure is. There's, that limits things quite a bit sometimes. And if you're putting something that's too big, it tends to almost, you know, the, when, the, when the wind comes, it tends to stress the structure <laughs> too much. Okay. So we have to work within limitations. So we were kind of conservative in proposing that. Those sound like important considerations. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Mr. Coop, then Ms. Gutwein. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation. This was very nice. Uh, it was... Uh, the, the signage was nice. It would be very, very effective, and Lake would be in a more conservative place. There's, none of this was like really wild, over-the-top stuff. It was just very nicely done. All of the bridges you showed are bridges that are done in place, have been redone. There, there is a, a little project coming sometime down the future at Wadsworth and 6th Avenue mm -hmm. where that's going to be an entirely new bridge. So is there more, well, in working with CDOT, more freedom to do something more with that bridge than just painting Lakewood across the, the top of it? Well, I can only speak to, we have been working with CDOT on a lot of the preliminary design work, actually. I don't know what the schedule is, and maybe um, others are maybe more aware of it, but we have been working with them, and there are more opportunities, and I think that that's a great opportunity to really um, do some things, like, say, on the bridge abutments, because you become you become coming over the top on Sixth Avenue, so there's a little less opportunities. But and as the final design gets developed, um, I think it's it's really a big opportunity that shouldn't that I would suggest it shouldn't be missed in terms of working with them to to in, incorporate some of these ideas. And so this is on the actual bridge itself yeah. and not in what would be a, the roundabout on one side or well there, there's even opportunities in um in the landscaped areas there'll be substantial landscaped areas around there as well which can um have some opportunities but you know there would be some cost as well but i think those are things that would need to be resolved worked through as the project gets closer to being, you know, reality and detailed designs are created, but we we'll think it's a good opportunity. Hopefully that'll stay on the top of everybody's list when that comes around. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gutwein and Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, I agree. I think this is really exciting, and I love the sense of pride and ownership that this opportunity brings to Lakewood. Um, I guess my question is about I, I like the branding, and I'm wondering if we can also connect some of the things that the city does for people. So, for example, um, we have a lot of zeroscaped medians, and if there can be, or zeroscaped parks, and just, you know, incorporate informational signs that say, um, the city of Lakewood did this, and, uh, I, yeah, I think it's, I, I've seen that in other cities, and it really, um, just explains to people what the city does in a in, in a beautiful way um so yeah i think this is great i love the bridge images and i'm really excited about this thank you and i would just add to that point the city did a nice job with the xeric plants out here in the plaza that lets people 
come down and take a look and see what, what it is, the name of it, and things like that. So that was well done. Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Oops. Thank you, Mayor. Roger, thank you. You've done a lot of hard work and a lot of thought has been brought into this. And actually, for me, it kind of makes me believe that now is maybe a good time that we as a city take a look at who we really are. This came to my attention several years ago uh, during a legislative race. Um, House 23 included Lakewood and it included Golden. And I started to realize very quickly that Golden identifies as a town. They have a very strong feeling of preserving their heritage, of preserving their past, very traditional. You don't see them tearing things down up in Golden. You see statues up there that are um, reflect that. You know, miners, farmers, things that are more traditional. And then it got me to realize that the city that I lived in identified as a city. It was a very different mindset. Looking more forward rather than backward. Both of the models, I think, are, are worthy and good. But Lakewood also has a tradition of farming, like Addenbrook Park over there on Garrison. Isn't there a, some kind of a, um, an old building there, the wooden building, and then also a, a water tower or something? And I would just like to say that I'd like to see us, as part of this discussion, and as we go forward, remember that we do have a past. And I'd like to see us maybe take that into consideration as well. Also, I very much second what Councilman Harrison said regarding the one sign that is 26 inches or 26 feet tall. For me, the style of it isn't something that I'm particularly drawn to, frankly. It seems like we're trying to identify with a 1950s image. I'm not real sure how that happened. But I actually agree that if we start doing things in a way that we don't allow our businesses to do, I think we set the wrong tone. And when we are looking at signage, the Belmar um, sign there at Alameda and Wadsworth that changes colors is lovely. But I've had several people tell me, how is it, and I'm sorry I need to name a name, how is it that Best Buy has such a large sign on a building and other uh, companies, other businesses don't? I think that needs to also be taken into consideration as we go forward. Um, you know, I remember the time when you would go down South um, Broadway and uh, Colfax and it was filled with billboards and we all collectively felt that billboards cluttered our, our line of sight, cluttered what we have. Um, those billboards, for the most part, have come down. Let's please take a look that we don't start to go into a direction with so much excitement regarding signage that we don't kind of swing that pendulum and back in that direction. I think the image that we want is um, appropriate, it's needed, but sometimes less is better. And when you are looking at a, um, a bridge and you've got a lot of things on it, let's just be reminded of what kind of an image we are actually putting out there. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. I just don't wanna see us clutter up our um, our streets, our bridges, with so much excitement of who we are that um, we cause too much busyness. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wadnell, Mr. Parker, Mr. Smith. Thanks for coming out. We look forward to uh, hearing from you here in the future with some more information. All right.
So next up, <clears throat> item four is a presentation by Principal Planner Stephen Wilson, and we're gonna have a little conversation about special districts. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mayor Paul and Lake City Council. My name is Stephen Wilson and I'm a staff planner with the city, as Mayor Paul just explained. And I'm here this evening to give an overview presentation on special districts. I've worked on projects with special districts for over 10 years, uh, and I've been on the board of a metropolitan district during the startup, but I'm certainly no expert on special districts. Uh, the following slides will be a planner's perspective on special districts, and Mr. Cox, the city attorney, uh, will add more specific information. The reason for tonight's presentation is that we have a pending application and we'd like to provide some background information uh, and answer some questions in advance. Uh, at the August 8th City Council meeting, uh, you'll be asked to uh, set a date for a public hearing in the future. And during the uh, August 22nd meeting, uh, you'll be asked to consider a service plan. For tonight's presentation, we're gonna review special districts how they're defined and what they do and how they're started. And then we'll focus more closely on metropolitan districts, uh, which are a type of Title 32 special district uh, and also a type of district that you'll consider in upcoming meetings. To give an example for some uh, orientation, uh, there are some pictures up there of uh, Solterra that has Metro District, uh, Denver West that has Metro Districts, and Belmar that has Metro Districts. To give some uh, orientation or, or to provide some context, um, I'd like to consider uh, how development happens. In planning schools, city building and land development are often presented in a linear manner. The ideal scenario would look something like the following. Public infrastructure would be installed by providers in advance of development in a way that would perfectly predict need. Existing super lot patterns would easily lend themselves to subdivision. Connections to infrastructure would be predictable and simplified, and the pattern could be repeated. In the real world, development is not so simple. Infrastructure exists, but it's generally not sized to anticipate extensive uh, future development. Lot patterns exist, but they don't often suit today's needs. Subdivision must occur and adapt to existing conditions. Connections to infrastructure can require offsite improvements. And adapting improvements into existing conditions can be challenging. What this all means is that land development can be complicated uh, and cities and developers need tools like special districts to make development happen in today's environment. Special districts can serve as one of those development uh, and city building tools. Special districts can provide necessary infrastructure for development or redevelopment needs. It can utilize public financing for infrastructure improvements that pays its own way. And special uh, districts can amortize infrastructure costs over time versus absorbing the cost with initial development. So what is a special district? A special district is any quasi-municipal corporation or political subdivision of the state of Colorado formed pursuant to Section 32 of the Colorado Revised Statutes. One of the things that we wanted to make sure you had available to you is what we're not talking about tonight, and that is the long list of other types of districts that you, the word is used frequently in Colorado law. There are even some cities that instead of wards have districts for their um, council members, which I find terribly confusing. But in the meantime, there are districts that can be created by cities or by counties that are different animals altogether. So as you go through this presentation, please keep in mind that Title 32 districts are what Stephen is talking about tonight, metropolitan districts in particular later on. Um, but we're not talking about business improvement districts, of which there are some uh, in Lakewood. General improvement districts you might have heard of, or special improvement districts. Those are all under Title 31, created by municipalities, but not 
the same uh, autonomous type uh, districts as the special districts under Title 32. And then you may know that there are also local and public improvement districts that can be created by counties under Title 30. So tonight we're talking about just the, the Title 32 special districts like the one that's coming before you in a couple of weeks. The statute, uh, Title 32, gives you a list of the possible categories of um, Title 32 districts, and you see them up there from fire protection like West Metro. You see metropolitan districts highlighted there, park and recreation, and, of course, water and sanitation districts that uh, exist in Lakewood as well. Uh, and, again, we'll come back to the metropolitan districts specifically after Stephen tells you some more about special districts generally. Um, the formation process we wanted to include in here and highlight the fact that we're at the step in this the case that uh, you're talking about and generally with Title 32 districts, your role exists at that first highlighted uh, step in the process, the service plan submittal and, and approval. Any special district that is to be formed within a municipality requires the service plan to be presented to the governing body, the city council in this case, um, for review and approval of that service plan. And we'll talk a little bit later about the criteria to be applied there. Uh, but that's not the end of the process. It's just the beginning of the submittal process. And I should mention, too, that when you have a district that crosses jurisdictional boundaries, you need to get the approval of all um, government entities, whether there's a county involved, another municipality, or what have you. But in this, uh, in the typical case, and in the one that's coming before you, it is a, a single municipality, uh, special district, all of the territory is located within the city of Lakewood. So the first step in that process is the service plan submittal and approval. But then when that is over with, the um, process continues with a petition um, to hold an organizational election, which Stephen will mention a little bit later. And then it goes to court for an order of the district court before the district can be formed. And it's all time sensitive, which is why the uh, district proposal is coming before you in a couple of weeks. So I have a, a, a couple of series of questions and answers, uh, trying to anticipate uh, what questions might be and how to provide some clarification. Um, and so the first one is um, about the differences between special districts and property owners associations. Uh, so a special district is a governmental entity, quasi-judicial governmental entity like a city, and a property owners association contracts with its members and its authority is granted through the contract. Special districts can provide a, a wider range of functions and services. Special districts can collect property taxes through the county and sales taxes through the city. District taxes and fees are easier and less costly to collect because they constitute a lien against the property. Uh, and taxes paid to a special district are deductible from income taxes. Then like a property owner's association, special districts can enforce covenants, and often they are used together. Uh, an integral part of uh, a special district is a service plan, um, and that's what you'll be asked to consider in the future. Service uh, plans, it's a document that is intended to establish the limit and purpose of the district, as well as the financial constraints. Uh, it is a document that must have city council approval before the organization of the district can be voted on in an organizational election. And then a servant service plan must contain certain things, including a description of proposed services, financial plan, preliminary engineering, uh, a map of its boundaries, general description of the facilities to be constructed, uh, information about cost, uh, description of any arrangement with other governmental agencies, um, and then also for, uh, if, if the, the service plan satisfies the four criteria for approval, uh, which Mr. Cox will review towards the end of this presentation. So there are uh, common powers of special districts, um, and special districts can uh, levy and collect ad valorem, uh, which are property taxes, can issue debt, uh, it can impose and collect fees, uh, enter into contracts and agreements, acquire, sell, and lease property, create enterprises, establish a special improvement district, uh, enforce covenants, 
and provide design review services, levy sales taxes uh, in some limited circumstances, and in some limited circumstances also uh, provide some eminent domain. Uh, governance is, is common for special districts and it has criteria. Uh, special districts are governed by a board of directors, usually five or seven members. Uh, the initial board is elected at the organizational election. Directors are elected for staggered four-year terms. And then to be an elector of a special district, one must uh, reside or be a registered voter and reside uh, or own property in the district or there are some uh, additional limited conditions. Special districts must comply with certain laws applicable to all governments, including open meeting laws, public bidding requirements, uh, public audit and budget requirements, disclosure, and it must comply with its service plan. There is uh, some municipal oversight. At the time of service plan review, cities can limit activities, limit borrowing, or limit the maximum tax rate. Once formed, special districts fun function as independent quasi-governmental agencies. However, once uh, cities can require uh, modifications to the service plan and annual reports, uh, cities typically review the finances every five years, um, as well as major modifications to service plans. So then getting a little bit more specific, so we've been talking generally about uh, Title 32 special districts, and then getting a little bit more specific about metropolitan districts. Um, metropolitan districts are a type of Title 32 special district that provides two or more of the services permitted by a special district, and I'll, and I'll list some of those services. Uh, and uh, metropolitan districts are an entity utilized to fund a wide range of infrastructure improvements necessary to support new commercial or residential developments. So metropolitan districts um, can provide services, um, including financing, constructing, operating, and maintaining improvements per the service plan. Typical improvements include streets, sanitary sewers, storm sewers, and landscaping. Improvements can be on-site or off-site, public or private, but must be within the actual district. Metro districts uh, cannot tax properties outside of their district, um, and they cannot increase taxes without a vote, and uh, they cannot level, levy sales taxes unless they're identified in the service plan. So why use metropolitan districts? Metropolitan, metropolitan districts uh, can generate independent sources of revenue to finance the cost of construction, owning, and maintaining project improvements. Metro districts can enable communities to ad address local infrastructure needs while allocating the cost to those who directly benefit. And it can provide perpetual operation and maintenance uh, of public improvements. So metro districts are authorized to finance specific things, authorized to finance improvements, including uh, street improvements, safety protection, water, sanitary sewer, transportation, television relay and translation improvements. Uh, interestingly enough, mosquito control, fire protection, and solid waste disposal. Which brings us to the question of how districts are able to generate revenue, which is typically through bonds. No, they're not, not that kind of bond. Okay, they were about halfway through. <laughs> this can be a little dry. Um, so again, so how are districts financed? Uh, there are different types of bonds. So there could be general obligation bonds um, that are secured through property taxes and a mill levy, and I'll go into a little bit more of that. Through revenue, um, from, from revenue sources through the district, and then through special assessments. And then uh, special or metro districts can use grants and loans as available. So the, the sources of revenue um, includes sales tax, special assessments, service charges and fees, and then property taxes, so similar to the last slide. 
And then in terms of property taxes, they're expressed uh, as a mill levy. Um, and so uh, mill levy is a tax rate that's applied to the assessed value of a property, and then one mill uh, is $1 per $1,000 of assessed value. So I have a couple of examples from Jefferson County here. Uh, so the first one there, it says Mr. Smith's home has provided services by four taxing entities. And then below there, you can see um, some of the taxing entities that make up the mill levy. So for this particular property, the mill levy is 90.165. So if you look at that as a calculation, you would have an assessed or an actual value of the home of $250,000, uh, an assessed rate of 9.6%, which is the rate that Jefferson County uses for all single family homes. And then, oh, excuse me, 7.96%. And then uh, the assessed value, which is the 250,000 times 7.96% is the 19,900 is the assessed value, and then that's what we apply the mill levy to that amount, um, but in, in uh, uh, divided by 1,000. So as you can see on the very bottom line, the taxes would be the 1,794, which is the assessed value times the mill levy. Hopefully that helps understand what a mill levy is and how they calculate it. There are um, examples of all different kinds of special districts in the city of Lakewood. We have the West Metro Fire Protection District. Uh, we have approximately 25 water and sewer districts. And then again, specifically to tonight's presentation, we do have metropolitan districts that exist in the city, uh, including Denver West, Elk Valley, Fossil Ridge, um, Springfield Green, which is Solterra, uh, the Plaza, which is Belmar, and then Vance Street. And now I'll turn it over to Attorney Tim Cox. What we uh, wanted to finish with here in this presentation as we open it up for questions is just a, uh, a little preview of what you are expected to do or required to do in evaluating a, a special district service plan. In uh, the statute, um, there is a, a section entitled Action on Service Plan and the Criteria, and these are the criteria that are found there. As Stephen mentioned earlier, uh, the service plan is required to contain the evidence supporting the finding of these criteria. So that's the first place that uh, you look to see if you think those criteria have been met. But they are that there is, and I, and I point out that the statute, instead of saying council shall approve unless, or uh, evidence is not shown, it says council shall disapprove unless evidence shows. It's, you get to the same place, but it's an interesting approach to the uh, to the process. Um, so you must find that sufficient existing need there's an, a sufficient existing need for the, that service or those services within the area to be served. Whatever services the district is proposing to provide, you must find that there's a, a need for that service in the area that the district will cover. Uh, that the existing service within the area is inadequate. It's kind of another way of saying the same thing as in the first criterion, but a little bit different. That the proposed new district is capable, through its financial plan, of providing economical and sufficient service to the area. And that the area itself, uh, based on the, the proposed mill levies and fa a financial plan, has the financial ability to discharge the proposed debt. Now, this list of criteria touches on some things that we did not really get into because this is intended to be Special Districts 101, an introduction, uh, fundamentals for you. Obviously, there are more complex levels of financing discussions and uh, debt limits that came up in a, in a service plan that you had the opportunity to briefly consider before it was uh, 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 withdrawn. Um, but these are the criteria that would be applied, and again, you'd look to the service plan initially for that purpose. Um, one other comment on the process that, that will be coming to you is that while you have uh, Stephen here as one of the principal planners, as you would in a land use case, uh, presenting uh, to you tonight on the uh, concept of special districts, these are not land use cases, so they look a little bit different when they come your way. Uh, you will get the, the customary resolution form and a request for council action form that describes uh, the proposal. 
in lieu of a staff report because it's not truly a planning case that is analyzed in the same fashion uh, as a uh, rezoning, for example. Uh, there'll be a, a cover memo that explains some of the, the uh, concepts and uh, addresses the criteria. That will be part of the materials that you get in advance of that uh, discussion. Uh, Stephen, was that it? No, I think that concludes the presentation, and now we are available for questions. Well, thank you very much. That's, uh, I think that's really helpful. It was helpful for me. And as we go into questions, I think we just want to make sure we're clear we're asking questions about the 101 and not the future project that we'll see. That'll come through in our packets um, at the end of this week. So uh, with that, we'll start with uh, Ms. Shakti. Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint email? Yes, I'd be glad to. Mr. Abel? Uh, thank you for that question, Shakti. I think it would be a lot easier for us to follow if we had this in front of us. Uh, a few questions. We saw how many special districts there are in Lakewood. How many are there in Golden, Wheat Ridge, Arvada, Denver? Lots. Uh, I, I, we've, Lots? We've not done a comparison. Lakewood has many fewer than it had at one time. Um, for various reasons, um, but I don't, I don't know if we have any any counts or comparison. We can certainly we can certainly put that together before the uh, next discussion. Please, and uh, I don't believe I saw Denver West Promenade District in that list. That was a the examples. It was not um, intended to be comprehensive, but that is a, a oh, okay. metropolitan district. So there's a longer list than that. Can you also get us a list uh, or a number of how many special districts we have? Certainly. <clears throat> there have been a couple of those in that list that have been problematic in the past. Uh, Mount Carbon, for instance, uh, went through its uh, <clears throat> throws back uh, 10, 15 years ago. Fossil Ridge Metro District, uh, last I checked, has not filed, according to Terry Schmedke, the uh, clerk to the board of the county commissioners, mm -hmm. they have not filed the service plan or financial, uh, uh, what do you call it, financial statement uh, with the proper uh, office at the county. DOLA has no teeth, Department of Local Affairs, which oversees these folks. Uh, so I have concerns about uh, who the authority we grant with and what our oversight is. Can we get uh, documentation of what we're required to do uh, in, in our oversight role as the creator of these districts? Sure, we can elaborate on that. And I believe the Doesn't the law require financial plans be filed annually? I know uh, some of the court uh, <clears throat> rulings that enable these require an annual financial statement, and yet we're told that we can go five years without looking at these. The, that's the typical review is, is five years, but the reference to annual reports, I think, was intended to cover, the, including the financial. Well, it would seem if... They're required to give us annual financial reports. It might be wise to look at them annually. Um, these, um, the eminent domain uh, mention makes me nervous. Can they exercise eminent domain outside their boundaries or only inside their boundaries? Uh, I don't believe it's it's rarely exercised, and I'm not familiar personally with uh, examples of that. But I don't believe they have the. I believe the the circumstances are limited to inside the district's boundaries. And if I'm not mistaken, when Lakewood asked for eminent domain, we had to get approval of the voters as part of our urban renewal authority. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So they would have to get approval of their voters, but. In the initial stages of these things, it's usually the developers are the only ones who own the properties when these things are formed. They put together the service plan, and uh, can they at that point 
grant themselves power of eminent domain. And then the, as these things are built out, I believe the blueprint calls for the board and, and the powers of the district to be shifted to the property owners as the developers pull out and finish their jobs. So we could have a board of um, five to seven members who are property owners or uh, participants in the development setting eminent domain rules for everyone down the road. I think that uh, one way that gets addressed is that it, if that's to be a, a power to be exercised by the district, I think you'd want, you'd see that in the service plan initially, and you'd want to know what limitations or be able to discuss what limitations could be imposed on that. If it were to be added later, I believe that would be a major modification to the plan that would require further council review and approval. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that is all I have at the moment. Thank you. Ms. Franks, then Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, I thought I saw in one of the slides where it said that City Council can either modify the service plan or recommend a modification and wanted to understand kind of the context of how that would come about and what would be the drivers for that. I think there are two references to modifications that you saw. One would be in the service plan review process as you're discussing it with the applicant if there are things that uh, you think need to be um, revised at that point before the service plan gets approved. That's part of the process that you have the ability to, to ask for those changes. The other reference is um, one of the powers that a local government retains over a special district after it's formed and becomes pretty much an autonomous entity is that the service plan cannot be modified in any significant way without it coming back and going through the same process as the initial service plan. That's a major modification to a service plan. Uh, can't go forward without city council approval using the same uh, process as the initial service plan is approved. Um, what's the differentiator between a minor and a major? Is there kind of a list of what qualifies as minor and what qualifies as major? There are examples that have come uh, from past cases of what is or is not a major modification. Um, I, I can be looking at that while we're answering some other questions. I didn't prepare that answer, but I'll be happy to look at where those are referenced in the statute. Um, uh, but there's not a comprehensive list. It's a little bit more of a, a spectrum where on the, on the spectrum it falls. Great. And then the last question was, is there a centralized place where these service plans are kept that we can get to, or is it each special district that has those? Because we mentioned, I think, Solterra, and it'd be interesting for me just to see, since it's in my ward, kind of what service plan they have in place out there. Uh, I, I know the clerk's office retains copies of all the service plans, and I would assume that they are kept in a segregated location. Ms. Johnson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, my goodness. This, this is all new material for me. This is kind of above my pay grade, frankly. And uh, I have a lot of questions. We're talking taxes on this. Ta t talk to me how that interfaces with Tabor. Um, I guess the simple answer to that would be the same rules that apply to local and state government apply to special districts when it comes to changes in tax policy. Uh, a district would have to get approval of voters before it could adopt a change in tax policy that results in a revenue increase. Um, and all the other rules with, with regard to Tabor with new taxes, changes, uh, increases in taxes uh, would require um, voter approval. Um, is, is that the, the okay. part of Tabor you were asking about? Well, I'm going to have to do some more studying on this, to be honest with you, Tim. And at one point, we're talking about board members. Um, how are they removed, and is there any possibility that somebody from city council would sit on that board, or is that traditional in some of these? The, the oversight on this is kind of making me a little nervous. Uh, 
it, it is certainly not typical to have any city officials uh, directly involved. Uh, even even if you're in a situation where somebody has an ownership interest in the property, I think you've got a conflict problem before you can even get started. So I don't think that's an issue. It's not. This is not again like a business improvement district, which is formed by the city and can and the uh, the city council in some cases can serve as the as the initial board and then uh, uh, make changes from there. So you're not going to have that uh, that interplay between the members of the board and the council that approves the, the uh, service plan. Okay. Um, I would assume that when the board members are chosen, there are certain qualifications, certain resumes, somebody's going to interview them. And also, I'd like to still know, how are the people removed if there's a problem with one? Um, as Stephen talked about, the initial board members are the owners within the, the district, the developers, when it's a developer-created district. And I should point out that we talked about some other types of districts within Title 32, like West Metro Fire, is not a developer district. It's not created by the developers as part of the land development process. But I think the more common scenario is exactly that. Um, and so the board members initially, if if the board uh, the district is formed through the process by approval of the service plan, the organizational election, that determines who the board members are. They are the owners at the time. And as uh, I think Mr. Abel mentioned, as those owners, uh, as the development happens and new owners come in and become uh, property owners within the district, they can become eligible to become board members. Again, we're not talking about the city council appointing a board based on their expertise. It's the developers coming forward saying, this is the property, these are the owners, this is who the board would be if the organizational election goes forward, uh, and then over time that, that changes. Um, but you're talking about elected positions, so with regard to removal, there's no opportunity for uh, the city council or any other body to uh, have that kind of control over the board. Uh, the voters have the control over the board, ultimately. So the board, the bo excuse me, the members, the landowners, would have to drive a recall, if you will, if well, they were uncomfortable with a, with a board? I, I'm... I haven't looked at the recall provisions to see if that comes into play, but generally speaking, it's as the owners become more numerous and, and have more of a voice, they control the outcome of the elections to a greater degree. Okay. And then there was also a list that Stephen gave that, of things that they can do, and it was can, mm -hmm. and one of them is annual reports. That sounds very loose to me. Um, they should and will have annual reports. I would like to see language that has a little bit more the, the strength. The city, city council has the ability to mandate the uh, filing of annual reports. Okay, and as far as oversight, particularly legislative oversight by us, um, if we're going to be the ones voting on something like this, then at some point... We need to have a look back and to understand more what's going on. How does that usually work with these? Well, once the district is formed through the court decree, um, the city's uh, the city council that created it uh, has a, has oversight in the respect of reviewing the annual reports, the financial review, which can happen at whatever intervals, uh, but it's typically done in five-year intervals, and then the ability to... Um, review and decide whether to approve modifications to the service plan. And I do have the uh, language from the statute on that. That approval of modifications is required uh, with regard to changes of a basic or essential nature, including but not limited to the following. So it's not a comprehensive list. <coughs> These are examples. Any addition to the types of services provided by the special district, a decrease in the level of service, a decrease in the financial ability of the district to discharge the existing or proposed debt, or a decrease in the existing or projected need for organized service in the area. And um, it further goes on to say, approval for modification shall not be required for changes necessary only for the execution of the original service plan or changes in the boundary of the service district of the special district. Um, so that's an example of what does not require city council review, but those 
um, changes in um, the services to be provided, the level of service, a decrease in the financial ability to service the debt, those would come to you for uh, approval of major modification through the same service plan uh, review process. Okay, now this board has the ability to levy fees, is that correct? Okay. What happens for the people that are having that fee levy? Do they have an appeal process? I mean, what if they don't want to pay that fee? How is that done usually? This is all new ground for me. Right. Well, the, these are um, statutory provisions that, that, that outline the, uh, the whole special district process. Um, there's extensive material on what they can, what their powers are. Uh, We've not gotten to the level of detail to review the appeal process for fees. Um, fees like fees charged by other governments have to be reasonably related to the expense associated uh, on the government side. So that would be the first uh, test is whether the fees are uh, reasonably close to the cost of providing the, the service for which the fee is charged. I assume that's going to be the same as for any government. Okay, and at one point there was some talk some language on sales tax and that that must be in the service plan. Right. And if, if the service plan doesn't authorize the collection of sales tax or the imposition of sales tax, then it is not part of the plan. Okay. And then, but the board can change what the initial sales tax rate is. The, the board can't impose a sales tax if the original service plan doesn't allow for that. They could... And, and they could not increase the sales tax rate without complying with TABOR. Okay, and then there was another place where you were talking about safety protection, and then under that it was mosquitoes. Does safety protection also talk about security-type patrols, or does it go beyond mosquitoes? Those are, those are two different things. So safety protection is one of the categories of services that can be provided by a metropolitan district, and mosquito control is another. There okay. are... There are parts of the state where mosquito control districts are a common thing. Okay, because they can both kind of be considered safety issues, like with the Zika virus type thing. So with safety protection, what exactly does that mean? I mean, does it like a quasi-police department? I, I, I'm trying to understand this. I'm better. not aware of an example of a district that specifically provides safety control uh, uh, or safety measures as a significant part of its service plan. There may be districts that include that because it's on the list of services that they can provide, but I, I'm not aware of a district that actually provides that service. By supporting something like this, does city council basically give this entity the ability to raise taxes? No. Okay. You know, this, like I say, this is very new for me. This is above my pay grade. It's already scheduled for August 8th that we're going to be looking at something particular and then later on something else. I'm wondering if we could slow this down a little bit and give us all a little bit more opportunity to really understand what these are and how this works and just how other cities do it. That's just me. Um, the, the schedule, just for clarification, uh, the state statute calls for, uh, at a certain point in the process, uh, the council, having received the service plan, um, to schedule a public hearing, much in the same way that you have a first reading on an ordinance and a second reading. Well, akin to the first reading is the step at next week's meeting. It actually can just be done by motion to schedule the service plan review for a public hearing, and that would be on the 22nd, and that would be the date that you'd be uh, receiving a full presentation from the applicant, and, and the opportunity would be there to ask all those questions. Would there be public comment at that point? It is a public okay. hearing, yeah. Okay. And, and I should add, one reason that we um, wanted to present this information tonight is because they, these are common uh, around the metropolitan area, but we haven't seen very many in Lakewood, even going back to previous councils. There haven't been a lot of new service plans introduced, new special districts introduced in the last eight or ten years. So uh, they're... We wanted to make sure there was some level of comfort with the process and the purpose and intent of these districts. And we will get a copy of the PowerPoint. Yes. And I don't know, are there any manuals or booklets that we can reference also to 
we, we can see if uh, that would be good. Or a municipal league or the special districts association has a, a some more information. Sort of a yeah, basic guide. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I would just. Can I add to that as well? Um, the actual service plan that's being proposed will be available to you in the next week. So you'll have that much time to review the actual plan. Today you got kind of a broad overview of all special districts and what they can do, but you'll get the actual plan that's being proposed within the next week. And that gives you a couple of weeks to review and to understand what that request is in terms of what the special district will do. And CML perhaps has some background information. You know, that's a good thought. I'll bet they do. I'll, we'll check on that and make that available. Yeah, there's there's a, the, the counterpart to the CML is the Special District Association, and that may be another resource for us. Perfect. Thank you. So, Mr. Cox, I, I would just a quick follow-up to Ms. Johnson's question about how other communities do it. Because it's prescriptive in state statute, every community does it the same way. It's just... The menu of options you can do different things yeah uh, generally speaking yeah let me elaborate on that a little bit um, some communities that have had uh, more uh, frequent encounters with new special districts or perhaps those that have had some issues with uh, uh, previously formed districts have seen fit to adopt a, uh, a, a policy a set of procedures um, which cannot really vary from the state statute in terms of the criteria and the contents of the service plan. But what it can do is structure the process so that it's a little bit more like a land use case where you have, um, uh, you know what, what's coming and, and the service plan gets submitted and it's, it's referred to certain uh, departments and uh, other agencies uh, and you go through a process like that. So uh, having had so few of these over the years, there hasn't really been much of a need to talk about a uh, a policy and procedure for special district review. Uh, it's certainly something that we can uh, talk about putting into place, but it, you're, you're correct that the, the, the ultimate decision is based on the same factors and the same criteria as uh, the statute provides. And, and another example of, of how this might work, there, there was a question about the consumer not being aware, but in a for sale type product, and let's maybe use uh, a new development out in the valley as an example, there was a water line brought in for $13 million, those bonds were sold to cover that. Upon closing of the property, those mills are listed to that buyer, right, as to what they owe. So it's up front in that, in that presentation and what they're getting into. So there's full disclosure upon closing that there's extra mills for these different things. Is that that's, correct? That's, that's the way it's supposed to work, right? Okay. Uh, Ms. Harrison and then Mr. Abel. <clears throat> um, I was having a little bit of a struggle trying to figure out who the quote unquote voters were. Can you define to me the difference between voters and owners and developers? Because I kind of got lost in there. Um, Stephen touched on the eligibility to be a voters, and it is either a resident of the district, an owner of the district, uh, uh, or a spouse of an owner within the district. And so that's the, the universe of individuals who can be voters. That universe changes obviously when you go from a developer owning perhaps the whole uh, project or the whole service area uh, and then it getting developed over time and more and more potential uh, um, voters uh, come into the picture and is that what you're asking i think so the when we were discussing the um, promenade west uh, there were renters that came and testified during that time, and they were very concerned that they were not allowed to be participating voters. And I just wanted to clarify that it is the actual developer until they sell, and then whoever they sell to it is the owner of that property, and or if they residents, does resident include renters, or is it how, how are residents defined in that? Um, I, you'd have to look at, look at okay. that definition. Thank you. Just to be clear on that. Mr. Abel and Mr. Coop. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson inquired about the Tabor vote. <clears throat> and the concept of Tabor is that 
the tax and abroad, if, when, if we introduce a new tax, and uh, then we would get a broad uh, a, opinion from the voters of our city uh, to levy this tax. That's a lot different than council imposing the tax without the vote. Uh, but the first five to seven members of this district are going to be the developers. And the developers will be those who vote on the Tabor aspect of the tax increase. So we have the controllers of the district being levying this tax that only later will shift to the broader number of property owners and they won't have anything to say about it. I, I think that's true. They're, the original owners are taxing them, voting to tax themselves and their successors in interest. Uh, but that, as, as the mayor said, that should be, uh, that information should be made available to anyone becoming a prospective owner within that district. The developers will, the first five to seven, will be appointed to staggered terms, some for two years, some for four years. Uh, until it perks around to where they're all four years and then they're term limited. So there is that removal process once they've served their eight years, they're out. But um, how isn't it the general rule that after the first two years, the developer still generally owns most of the property and the uh, people who run for uh, directorships are the same people who had that two-year staggered term. So it, it is a long, it's a, quite some time before the new property owners gain control of the board. Is that right? I, I, obviously, the, depending on the complexity and size of the development, the, right. the duration right. can be that much longer. Yeah. Right. Uh, the mayor had a comment about this being fully divulged at closing. I've been through closing. Nothing's fully divulged. It's in the paperwork. It will say it, but I don't recall anybody telling me what my school taxes were going to be when I was signing 400 sheets of paper, one right after another, as the agents throw them in front of you. So disclosure is a matter of... Uh, Relativity, I guess. I suppose that's true. It's honored in the breach, perhaps. And then, lastly, when Belmar formed its special district, it included $6 million annually for mosquito control. Uh, I often thought that I'd get a few cans of Raid and go out there and do it for $5 million and give them a deal. So is there any... Will we be able to look at this service plan and say, six million for mosquito control, that seems exorbitant, and change, or ask that that be changed, or require that that be changed? Yeah, keeping in mind the criteria, which include that there's a, a need for the service in, within that area, and that the existing service within the area is not adequate, I think that's where you'd have the opportunity to question those kinds of numbers. Right. My concern is that, uh, say, a son-in-law of one of the developers might start a mosquito control district and get paid fabulous amounts of money for controlling uh, a few mosquitoes. Well, the good news is you'd have the opportunity to review that service plan, too, if they're going to start a mosquito control district. That's okay. Yeah. Um, and as far as sales tax goes, they can only levy sales tax if they have retail establishments within the district. Thank you. Mr. Coop, then Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mayor. This district only can deal with what is in their boundaries, correct? If they have no dealings, they can't, the, the people next door right outside of the boundaries, there's, they're totally separate, correct? Right. There's no direct impact. They're not. Uh, their property is not uh, directly affected. There obviously, maybe circumstances where there's an impact, but it's not a. Uh, and but they don't the yeah. fees, taxes, whatever. Not nothing at all. It's just all within the the district's boundaries. Okay. Thank you. And the next question is: Are these fees, uh, taxes, 
Are they collected to cover things that the city normally takes care of, like streets and sewers or whatever they're, they're, they're destined collect, to be spent on? They're collected to cover the administrative costs of whatever is being provided by that district, which sometimes involves um, services or improvements that might otherwise be uh, handled or provided by the city. Yeah. So it's public improvements um, and, in some cases, private improvements within the district. Um, but, yeah, it, it, the fees have to be tied to those services, and presumably there's a need for those services no, no matter who's providing it. So, so to, to build them and then to maintain uh, into the future. Right. Okay, thank you. Ms. Harrison. Just a, a clarification. I think um, before we get really concerned about the taxing part, we've got to remember, I want to make sure that I understand this correctly, they can determine a tax mill potential, I mean, we're going to approve it, but they're not going to make it so high that people don't want to buy in um, because that defeats the whole purpose. So they can't pie in the sky, choose a thousand percent, whatever that would be, because no one would buy into that, correct? Am I understanding this process? There has to be kind of this balancing act between the mill levy to support the services and yet make that property a sellable commodity for that developer. Well, right. The mill levy that's proposed is, is going to be based on an analysis that it's the amount of money necessary to cover the cost of the improvements. And so it's got to be relative to what's being uh, provided. Uh, but there is also a, a marketability analysis. And that doesn't just, that's not just limited to the mill levy within the district. It's the mill levy in the district on top of whatever the mill levy is for all the other providers that you have. So someone who's going to buy in that area is going to look at that mill levy and whatever else there is and do the total, and that's when you see the real impact. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, Ms. Hodson, looks like you want to jump in. Go. May I add one more thing? We do have another study session um, scheduled before the actual hearing on the 22nd. And so here's what we can do if you're interested. On August 15th, we can answer this publicly, the, uh, provide the answers to your questions so all the people who watch online will have that information. Um, and that would include, just to give you a sampling, um, question, um, information about all of the lists, all of the special districts that we have currently in the city of Lakewood, um, how many special districts in other cities in the metro area, um, defining residents, as Councillor Harrison asked, and so on. So we'll go through this list if you're interested, and we can provide that to you on the 18th just for additional information. And in the, on August 15th, we can do that if you're interested. And we can also make sure all of this information, including the PowerPoint, is available to you all and also online for people who are interested in doing research. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Cox, Mr. Parker. Appreciate our 101 on uh, special districts this evening. So uh, that exhausts our agenda. We'll go into reports. I have two quick things. I'm going to do a walk and talk on Saturday at Union Square Park from 9 to 10.30 a.m. So come on out if you'd like to chat, and we'll check out uh, a nice park over in Ward 1. And then tomorrow night is National Night Out, and you can go to lakewood.org to find out the locations. And this is really, really a cool deal, and I think it's a testament to how much our community appreciates our police department and our first responders because there are more uh, events this year than there have ever been. So if, if you have the opportunity, the council members can be running all over the city. I think there's over 50 this year. So it's really cool, and I, I hope folks can get out and really enjoy the, the evening, meet their neighbors, and definitely uh, talk to our police agents and our other first responders. That's it. Ms. Johnson? No report. <laughs> Just on Saturday at uh, the trolley car number 25 at the Federal Center is having an open house. Um, it's at 10 o'clock in building number 78. You go through gate one off Kipling, uh, Kipling and 6 near Kipling and 6 and bring your ID. And it's pretty cool. It's totally, it it's, um, was much cooler than I anticipated. 
<laughs> you almost said totally cool. <laughs> that was great. Ms. Vincent. No report. Mr. Royball. No report. Ms. Harrison. Oh, I have a couple of things. All right. Um, South Lakewood Business Association will be um, having a meeting tomorrow morning at 730 at White Fence Farm, how to retire in style. So anybody that wants to figure that out, come on by. We'll have a great panel. Um, August 6th, Lakewood Symphony is having a concert with the Colorado Mormon Chorale at the Heritage Center, and it's going to be a fantastic thing. Um, I really encourage you to try to buy those tickets. And on August 8th, South Lakewood Business Association will be having a seminar at White Fence Farm, 7 p.m. p.m. in the evening um, on Colorado Constitutional Amendment 69, the single-payer health um, situation. There will be speakers on both sides, so be sure to come. If you want to come, there is space, but we need to have you RSVP to 303 986-0031. Thank you. Mr. Abel? No report. Ms. Franks? Ms. Gutwein? We had such a long meeting last time. I didn't thank everyone um, who came out to our ward meeting for our last Saturday. and It was a really great meeting where we had a bunch of um, representatives from the different neighborhoods in Ward 5 talk about the exciting things they had going on. Um, so it was really fun to hear from all of you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Well, Mr. Cox, anything else for the good of the org?